So I'd like to talk to you today uh, about uh, this topic, and, and really it's a question that I want to ask all of you, and that is this. Is the cart before the horse in your life? Is the cart before the horse in your life? We don't have any record of Jesus using any form of the word religion. Yet the word religion is used a lot in our culture today around the world. And yet we have no record of Jesus ever using any form of the word religion. He uses a different word to denote an intimate, heartfelt connection with God. And that word that Jesus used to denote a connection with God is the word faith. Faith is a relational word. Inherent in the word faith is this concept of trust. When you have faith in somebody, you have trust in somebody. And so the earliest followers of Jesus regularly described themselves not as religious, but they described themselves as spiritual people. That's how they described themselves. As an example, when Jesus refers to the church, he's always referring to whom? His followers, isn't he? He's not referring to a building. He's not referring to a organization or what we might define as a denomination. Not referring even to the building that the early church people, followers of Jesus met in, or any organization to which they ultimately would belong. And Jesus viewed things such as prayer and baptism and the study of the scriptures, a gathering together, um, charitable giving, many of the things that we do on a regular basis, he looked at those things as expressions of a spiritual life. That's what he viewed them as, expressions of a spiritual life, the spiritual life that God gave to us. But he did not view prayer or he did not view assembling together or charitable contributions or all the other things that we do as followers of Jesus, he did not view those things as a means or a way to obtain the life that Christ has offered to us. Those aren't the ways that we obtain the life of Christ. It's not the means that God has made available to us to obtain that life. And the good news message of Jesus includes this wonderful, beautiful truth that God gives us this spiritual life as a gift. It's a gift. Which the Bible uh, writers, the biblical writers, summarized by using the word grace. They use the word grace to summarize or describe this gift that God makes available to us. Now, oftentimes when I say things like this, people say, well, it doesn't, it, it, does our behavior not matter to God? It matters a lot. But it actually probably matters more to each of us than it does to God. Fact of the matter is, my wife actually does care how I treat her. And I care how you treat her. And so we're not saying that our behavior doesn't matter. My behavior matters to you. My behavior and my integrity matters to you. You wouldn't be coming here if you knew that I wasn't a person of integrity. If you knew there were all sorts of things in my life that were contrary to moral values, you would have a hard time coming here and sitting under my leadership and my teaching. Of course, the Lord wants us to live morally good lives. But the goodness that we live out in this world is an act and or should be an act of gratitude for the spiritual life that God has given to us not a religious attempt to earn that life to become good enough. There's a big difference. 
the life that I live, the way that I try to live sacrificially and being generous and giving to other people and putting others first in my life, I don't do that to obtain eternal life. I do that because I appreciate the eternal life that God has given to me. I appreciate the gift of eternal life that Christ has given to me. And the earliest followers of Christ taught that living a good and loving life should be the joyful expression of a person who has received eternal life. I've received eternal life, and therefore he's given me joy, and because of that joy, I want to live a life that expresses that, that life of love and grace. But nowhere should we ever feel that doing these good things is how we obtain eternal life. So we read in the book of Romans, a very short verse. Paul is writing, of course, to the church that's in Rome. And obviously there's uh, oppressive rulership, especially to Christians in Rome and uh, obviously false gods, and he writes this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, this wonderful scripture that's very revealing. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Boy, there's a lot packed into this one very short verse. Uh, The First of all, the, the word wages like points to uh, an analogy of, of a salary, doesn't it? When you go to work and at the end of the week or the end of two weeks or however your pay apparatus goes, you get a paycheck. You get wages for your, for your labors. And wages are always connected to work, the work that we do. And so uh, this analogy is that uh, we have all received a wage for what? Our sin. There's a wage connected to our sin. If sin was a job that we worked hard at, and a lot of us have been there and done that, right? Right? Right, Mike? (laughs) If sin was a wage, a a job rather, that we worked hard at, once payday came and we collected our wages or compensation, the check would read death. That's what the paycheck would read, death. And the fact of the matter is, all of us would have earned every penny of it. Because we've all what? Sinned, fallen short. So we've all collected that check with the word death on it. We've all done that. But notice the rest of the verse. I want us to notice what it says and what it actually doesn't say. Let's read it again, Jack. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if the Apostle Paul was simply introducing, shall we say, another religion, and by the way, we need another religion like we need another war or another pandemic. We don't, we don't need more religion in the world. And if Paul was actually introducing another religion here, this verse might read something like this. For the wages of sin is death, but the wages of working for God is eternal life. If he was trying to introduce another religion, that's probably how he would have written that verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the wages for working for God is eternal life. But this really isn't about changing employers. It isn't. It's not about changing employers for better pay. We see people trying to do that a lot nowadays, don't we? They just quit their jobs. I'm not going to work for this. You need to pay me more money, whatever. But this isn't changing employers for a different pay. It's about a spiritual journey where we actually stop working and we actually accept or receive a gift from God. That's what this is. 
And by the way, the gift wasn't earned. It's free. It's free. And it wasn't given to you because you qualified for it. It was offered to every single one of us because of the generosity of our Father in heaven. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift not earned, right? The gift not earned of God is eternal life. And we should not carry the burden of trying to live exceptionally good lives in order to be qualified for salvation. Let me say that again. Because in an organization that oftentimes focuses on behavior, this is hard for us to actually accept at times. Isn't it? And you want to know why judgment is so much higher in the church than it is in the world? Because our focus is on behavior. And when someone's behavior doesn't measure up to what we think it should be, our response is judgment. And yet God says he's given you and I a free gift. Now, our behavior matters. But it doesn't matter in whether the gift is being offered to us or not. My behavior matters to you, doesn't it, Jax? My behavior matters to all of you. Would you nod your heads and say yes? (laughs) If you shook your head this way, I'm just going to say, I think you're lying. (laughs) So let's not make this about Behavior doesn't matter. Behavior is the cart. God is the horse. And so often we put the cart in front of the horse to get to God. Followers of Christ are certainly encouraged to live loving lives, loving each other caring lives out of gratitude for what we have received, not as a qualifier to get that gift in our lives. Not out of fear of losing our spot in heaven. I love to hold my wife's hand. I like to embrace her. I'll be so bold as to say, I love how she kisses me. And I love to kiss my wife. But I don't do it because I'm afraid she's going to divorce me if I don't. I do it as an expression of what is in my heart for her. I love to do things for her. I want to do things for her. I want to go to the store with her so she doesn't have to do it by herself. And now all you wives don't look at your husbands and say, why don't you do that? I'm just talking about my relationship with my wife and the things that I know blesses her. I want to be a blessing to her. You know why? Because I love her and I'm so thankful for the gift that she is to me. I don't do those things because I'm walking around in mortal fear that I'm going to come home and the house is going to be locked. (laughs) With the keys changed. Paul was writing the church at Ephesus, and he said it actually this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. Wow, that should be pretty clear, shouldn't it? Right? I mean, he, he saved us by his grace, and there's not one thing that we can take credit for in this salvation. It is a gift from God. Yes, it's a gift. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So God has plans for us to do good things. Our behavior matters, especially to each other. 
it matters. But it doesn't come to a, a, acquire this gift. It comes because we have already received it and we're thankful for it. So notice that the gift of spiritual life comes where? First. The gift comes first. God saved you by his grace. The only thing we do is we receive it or we believe it. We believe and then in the believing we receive. And notice that the gift of spiritual life comes first. Then the good works come as a result of that. This kind of good behavior is not like the prisoner of war attempting to impress the warden in order to somehow be released from prison camp. And oftentimes that is our perspective. If I simply do this, do that, say this, say this, what have you, if I pray enough, if I read my Bible enough, or if I go to church enough, or if I give in the offering, especially if I give in an offering, then I'm expecting God to somehow do something for me. And we're hoping to impress the warden of the prison camp sufficiently enough that maybe he'll let us out on an early release. It's the joyful and grateful expression of a prisoner of war set free that results in the good behavior. I don't know if you remember the series Band of Brothers came out a few years ago, and there was one very moving episode in that particular series of uh, you know, movies, that, uh, and it was about World War II, and this particular series was called Why We Fight. And it was uh, shortly after the the beginning of 1945 and the Allied troops were making more inroads and they had now gotten into Poland and they'd now gotten into parts of Germany as they were moving towards Berlin. And they came through this forest and into this clearing and here was a site that was, they were aghast at what they saw. And it was a death camp. It was where the Nazis had housed or put into prison, uh, mostly Jews, and they had forced them into some kind of slave labor. And when they were uh, sick and dying, and some of them were put into uh, gas chambers and burned, the Allies came across this horrific site. And they opened the doors, and one very moving scene shows this emaciated prisoner who had really virtually been in slavery. And he came up, and he took this soldier's face in his hands and kissed his cheek. I asked myself today, can I kiss the cheek of Jesus? Because he has set me free. It's not the things that I've done. He has given me a gift of eternal life. I was in that prison. I was not able to get myself out. I was in a bondage that I was not able to free myself from. And he came and he opened that prison door. And he invites me to come and walk with him. We do not have to work for salvation. God gives us salvation. He gives us life, and he gives us love, and he gives us everything we need up front, not after. He makes it all available to us up front, including having a purpose for why 
we want to even live in this world today. I would just ask you all this question, and you who are watching my live stream, have you discovered that purpose for why you are alive today? Because if you haven't, God is here to give you that purpose and reveal it to you, the true meaning of life. Religious people often miss this message. And it's because they have turned to rituals, they've turned to regulations, they've turned to oughts, they've turned to all sorts of activities prescribed to them as the way to achieve what God has already offered them as a gift. And believe it or not, this is why Jesus and the religious leaders had such confrontations with each other. Jesus came to set prisoners free so he would heal a blind man on the Sabbath. He would heal someone who had been paralyzed for 38 years on the Sabbath. Because it wasn't about trying to climb a ladder or a stairway to heaven. Because Jesus already knew that the ladder had already been descended from heaven. But in doing all of these things, they forget that salvation is a free gift and they miss the life that God has for them and they fail to satisfy the spiritual thirst that they have. There are many kinds of forms or different forms of slavery in our world. In my opinion, the most heinous kind of slavery was the kind that we allowed to take place in our country, in our past. I I personally think that's the most heinous kind of slavery. But there are many kinds of slavery in the world. There's slavery to other people, which is what we suffered under, and our civil war was a result, I think, of that. But there's also slavery to drugs. There's slavery to power. There's slavery to fear. People are in bondage to fear. There's slavery to sex. There's slavery to money. And the common denominator of slavery is this. Anytime there's slavery, there's an absence of freedom. That's a common denominator. There's an absence of freedom. And salvation can never be achieved And any time we try to achieve it, we lose our freedom. We become slaves. It can never be achieved. It can only be received. And any stairway to heaven that we must climb in order to achieve God's approval and achieve God's love is pure spiritual slavery. It's spiritual slavery. And Jesus came to do what? Set the prisoners free. So Paul is writing now the church in Galatia. And these Galatians were the... uh, they, They had now started to fall into a problem. And he recounts a story that took place in this community or town called Antioch, which is where they first called the followers of Jesus Christians. And the story goes something like this, that that Paul and Peter were there, and there were a bunch of Gentiles that had come to know the Lord, and they were so excited, and they were so free in their walk with God. And then some what's called Judaizers came, to Antioch from Jerusalem. And Peter starts to connect with them, and they start saying, well, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you you need to get circumcised if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, and you have to start doing these things. And what they did was they were starting to bring all the Old Testament laws forward into their relationship with Christianity or with Christ. Peter gets persuaded by them, and Paul and Peter butt heads. 
And the book of Galatians is actually written basically telling that story. And he starts in the first chapter and saying, you started so well. What happened? What happened? And some of us have started really well. And some of you watching has started really well. You remember the joy it was to serve the Lord. But now the joy's gone. And it's a bunch of rules and regulations. And the intimacy with Christ is no longer there. And you put the cart before the horse. But Paul has something that will free us all today if we will buy into it. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and then verses 13 and 14. So Christ has set, truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. See, we, we, we just need to ponder that a lot. So Christ has truly set us free. But now make sure what? You stay free. You stay free. How do we lose that freedom? By thinking that walking with Jesus is about all the things I have to do. When it becomes that, you've lost your joy and you've lost your freedom. And now you're under a yoke of slavery because it's no longer coming out of a heart of gratitude, but rather it's coming out of an, an exertion over you. And that is not what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus. I think, that's, I think that this is all so deeply embedded in our thinking that a lot of us listen to this and don't even realize that we have that yoke on us. You're so right. And it's because... We want to exert behavior out of people, and the way to do it is you morally manipulate them. And we do it through judgments. What would this person think? What would dad think? What would the pastor think if they knew I did this? And we have lost our freedom that Jesus has given to us as a gift. It's also like I see a hamster running on a wheel. Yes. And there's no end to it. No end to it. And it even goes into like, I know I'm going to heaven. I mean, I get that. But sometimes, you know, there's been so many things. You should do this. You should do this. You, need, you know, we were in discipleship school. You need to read 10 chapters in the Bible every day. Yep. You know, and so many ways of being to be the best Christian you can be. And, and um, when I, you know, sometimes I hear this voice telling me how disappointed God is in me because I haven't kept up to all of the, these modern day laws. Right. And like you said, it is so deeply ingrained in us. Um, I tell you, the beginning of freedom for me, believe it or not, I owe to your dad. Wow. Because I worked for him for two years, pouring concrete. And there was a part of me that would look at other people who weren't reading 10 or 20 chapters in their Bible a day. They weren't praying two, three hours a day. They weren't at church every time the doors were open. And I began to judge them for not doing all of that stuff. And then I needed employment. And Ted said, well, why don't you come and work for me? The best thing and the worst thing I did in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> but I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning, leaving the house, working all day. Mike knows about all this kind of stuff. You work for Ted, I think, a little bit, right? <laughs> Carrying forms, pouring concrete, getting home at 6, 6.30. Concrete in my hair, exhausted, tired. After I took a shower and cleaned up, I barely had enough strength to eat supper and play with my, at that time, two-year-old or one-year-old son for a half an hour and fall into bed, only to do it all again the next day. 
And pretty soon, I began to question where my heart was with God. Because I wasn't able to read 20 chapters a day. I wasn't able to pray two, three hours a night. I certainly had no desire to go to church every night of the week. And the model of what it meant to be truly a committed Christian was a skewed model for me. And God put me in the concrete business, and the best training I ever, ever had for the ministry was working for my father-in-law. It didn't come from a Bible school or seminary. The best training I ever had for the ministry was having to pour concrete. Because it taught me how hard people have to work for a living. And just because I can sit now in my office and plan all sorts of events for the church, for all of you to attend and participate in, doesn't mean you have the time, the energy, or the resources to be able to do it. And then on top of it, we start saying, well, if you really love God, you would do this stuff. And now our walk with God becomes all the things we have to do And that's how we retain our salvation. And that's how we don't lose our spot in heaven. And that's how we earn God's love. And that's how we earn God's love and his favor. It's a lie. And it is a lie. And it's right here. Make sure that you stay free. Mm -hmm. And don't get tied up again in that slavery to the law. All these odds. Let's finish it. Listen. I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God... And by the way, we can insert any 21st century religious law in there other than circumcision. Mm -hmm. You know, we we can just insert, you know, whatever law you want to insert in there that we, that, that the church through history or whatever, or we've been made to feel that needs to be there. We can just insert that there. And... I tell you that if you're counting on that to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. Of no benefit to you. Yes. We did it ourselves. I want Jesus to be all the benefit I can get from him. Don't you? I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. Go on. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Yeah, this faith and trust we have in Christ being expressed as a result of, shall we say, um, our walk with God, we have this expression of love and grace and so forth. Then there's two more verses, 13 and 14, that I I love that line. Faith expressing itself in love. Yes. That's so good. For you have been called to live in freedom. Let's get this. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Some, Some people say, well, I don't know if I'm called to do that. You know, that's usually what somebody says when they actually don't want to do something. Right. Right. Well, not not always, but but let me tell you what, you know what our our real calling is? Our real calling is to live in freedom. Yes, yes. The freedom that Jesus has given to us, where his spirit leads us into all forms and sorts of things that will bring pleasure to him and bless each other. Oh, a call to live in freedom just sounds joyful. It does. Yes. Just think of that prisoner that kissed the cheek of that soldier. He, that's all that he could figure out how to do to express his appreciation for being set free. Yeah. Not I have to, yeah. I get to. Right. Yeah. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Yes. So you, we can let the pendulum swing too far, can't we? Yes. Well, I don't need to do anything. No, well, People are good at that. Yes, we're really good at letting the pendulum swing too far. 
The pendulum should be right there in the middle, not too extreme here, not too extreme there. And let your freedom, don't let your freedom rather, be used for license, but rather or to satisfy your sinful nature here. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Yes. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when we focus on our behavior, we're putting the cart before the horse. What we need to focus on is the beauty of the Lord. We need to focus on how he gave his life to set us free. We need to focus on falling deeper in love with him. When I got married, and Jackie and I are going to celebrate 48 years this June. That's all. That seems like a long time. It's gone fast. It has gone fast. And I was deeply in love with Jackie when we got married, but I am more in love with her today than I was before. And the reason for this is 48 years of receiving her gifts of love and expression to me has caused my heart to grow bigger and deeper. And I want us all to fall in love with Jesus more. The more we fall in love with Jesus, the less I'm going to have to ask you to do anything. It'll just be in your heart to want to. And when we love Jesus, he puts in our hearts the want to, to bless. And we need to receive again his gift of grace to us. Free gift of grace to us. And he has extended this ladder down from heaven. We don't have to build one to make it to heaven. We don't have to achieve or, or, or to qualify somehow to get into heaven's gates. It's all been done. It's completed. Jesus even said on the cross, it is finished. And what he meant by that is everything has been completed and now everybody can receive the gift of eternal life. Everybody can receive it. There's nothing left to be done except one thing. And that is, let's start walking with him. Let's just start walking with him. Let's start believing in him. And I can't think of a more wonderful invitation than it's all done. Take my hand. Just walk with me. Just walk with me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have given yourself to every single one of us so that we could receive this wonderful gift to salvation. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Jesus, for that. I'm going to ask Pastor Robert to come and just really say a prayer that will solidify this and pray for you who are watching online uh, that maybe you're in a place that uh, religion has gotten the best of you. And maybe you're very similar to Jackie and I where so much was ingrained in us and it's taken me a lifetime to try and unlearn some of this stuff. And we live under this yoke of bondage, thinking that we're, we're never measuring up. And I want that to be broken in you today. And I want today to be that first day that that prison door has been opened up. And maybe you can kiss the cheek of Jesus.